Howdy everyone, welcome back to stuff I wanted to talk about in the Massive Riku video, but didn't end up getting to it for one reason or another. This is a series of videos where I am continuing my conversation about the queer subtext of Kingdom Hearts and how that text plays into the overall narrative of the games and how it points to the fact that Riku is in love with Sora. Like I explained in the last video, I was going to do these videos later on this year, but after hurting my shoulder last September, I'm not really able to draw for very long. But that doesn't mean that I can't edit and continue to gush about one of my favorite series of all time. So before I begin, a reminder that I am assuming that you have already watched my Riku is Gay and Why It Matters video and the other video that I've done so that I don't have to repeat topics that I've already covered. To really get the best viewing experience, I do highly recommend that you watch these videos in the order that I release them. So if you haven't watched those, you can click on the cards or go into the description to get a link to the playlist that'll get you up to speed. Have fun! So with all of that out of the way, today I wanted to take a look at Kingdom Hearts 3 again, <laughs> but this time specifically talk about the new songs that Utada Hikaru wrote. This is the first time Utada has written two songs at once for the series, something completely unprecedented up till now, with many of us worried that Utada wasn't going to return for Kingdom Hearts 3 at all. But they did make it happen, and a big motivator for their comeback seemed to be fans hoping and praying for her return. We also think that the new theme song by Utada Hikaru is a huge point. Since the songwriting process had to fit alongside Miss Utada's other artistic activities, we started working on it at a very early stage. I think perhaps the energy of KH fans all over the world has reached Miss Utada. Utada Hikaru, who had done the theme songs up until now, took a very long hiatus, and there were worries about what would happen for Kingdom Hearts 3. But it appears that she safely returned to activity and was placed in charge of the theme songs this time as well. Utada-san was asked to do new songs for non-numbered titles as well, but there was never an opportunity for that to be realized. This time around, though, we humbly asked her to do a new song for the numbered title. And there was a suggestion on her part not to do just an arrangement of the opening song, but to prepare another song, which made us very happy. I think the power of Kingdom Hearts fans from all around the world was what moved Utada-san to do so much. I thought that the cause couldn't be anything other than the huge amount of messages she receives from the world over. So it was actually Utada who wanted to do more than one song for Kingdom Hearts 3. And both of these songs might just be my own personal favorites. I love all of the opening songs, so it is hard to choose. But damn, they're just so good. And we're really lucky to have gotten multiple fantastic songs from Utada throughout the course of this series. The opening song for Kingdom Hearts 3, Face My Fears, definitely sets up the tension and conflict at the beginning of the game, but Don't Think Twice has a different vibe to it, and it seems to be doing something new for the series and kind of foreshadowing things to come, or at least giving us more insight into some characterization. You know, it's complicated and we'll get there. <laughs> I'll explain. In my original analysis, I talked about how Sanctuary was written with Nomura's help. He gave Utada a plot summary of Kingdom Hearts 2, specifically wanting Sanctuary to be a song about Sora and Riku and their reunion. If we're to take that at face value and analyze how the lyrics reflect on the characters, we get shown a lot about how Riku feels about Sora, including the backwards lyrics about needing true emotion and I need more affection than you know, signaling Riku's hidden feelings. And I also talked about how Simple and Clean makes the most sense also coming from Riku's point of view about the events in Kingdom Hearts 1. But... I didn't end up talking about how Kingdom Hearts 3 songs fit into the narrative, so I don't want to fix that today because... <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> this is gonna be a doozy. Because of the precedent of Utada and Nomura working together by Nomura sharing story notes of Kingdom Hearts 2, it only makes sense that Kingdom Hearts 3 would follow that same kind of creative cooperation. 
we do have confirmation of Nomura writing Otada another plot synopsis for the story and then letting her work her musical magic. Nomura even complimented Chikai slash don't think twice for how it only got better and better after multiple listens. Did you make any orders for the theme song Chikai this time? I didn't make any specific orders. Rather, I told Utada about the plot synopsis so far, and that the battle that has gone up to now will come to an end with Kingdom Hearts 3, and that answers will be given for the various problems that characters have had. Mr. Nomura, did you have any specific requests for the theme song? I provided an explanation of the series so far, and some simple details about the content of Kingdom Hearts 3, and then left it in Miss Utada's hands. What were your impressions upon hearing the completed song? Hikari, simple and clean, for example, is a very straightforward song, but Chikai isn't as strong in a way that smacks you from the beginning. Instead, thanks to the complexity of its composition, it has a strength that pierces deeper and deeper the more you listen to it. I think it's a beautiful song. Nomura saying that he gave Utada a plot synopsis of the series so far, as well as a few of the details about character development from 3, is what really catches my eye. Because I think I've made a pretty solid case in the Riku video that the series is best understood once you understand this story is about Sora and Riku. Also, since Simple and Clean and Sanctuary both focus on Sora and Riku, it only makes sense that Kingdom Hearts 3 would follow the same pattern. We also can't forget that the KH series producer, Shinji Hashimoto, has said this about Kingdom Hearts 3 specifically. The fact is, the main focus of the series is Sora and Riku, how their friendship develops, but also how they grow up. So, if that's what's said about Kingdom Hearts 3 and the series as a whole, it really only makes sense that Nomura's plot synopsis that he gave Utada would also mostly focus on that and therefore the theme songs would follow suit. Which, oh boy, okay. <laughs> I feel like this, this one, this is the video where people might really be questioning the premise before I get a chance to explain myself. And that's because Chikai slash Don't Think Twice is a pretty explicitly romantic song. I can definitely see how someone might be thinking that I'm just reaching and trying to force this song to fit with Sora and Riku, but please, I just ask that you hear me out because there is a lot to this song and some very damning evidence to go with it. Of course, I have my biases, we all do, but I want to make it clear that I did not go into this with the mindset of how can I make it fit? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Instead, the song slapped me across the face with a hammer that had this is about Sora and Riku engraved on it. So please feel free to hold on to your skepticism. I get it. But I held off talking about this one until I could give it a proper deep dive for a reason. I think you'll understand by the end why this had to be its own whole video. First, I do briefly want to talk about the other song Utada wrote, Face My Fears. It's a bop, and it's pretty self-explanatory for how it relates to the Kingdom Hearts plot. It's probably one of the most straightforward of Kingdom Hearts opening themes in depicting how the music and lyrics tie into the story. It's a buildup of anticipation before the storm, voicing sorrow, separation, and the building up to facing something scary in an emotional sense. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Some people don't care much for Skrillex's hand in the music, but personally, it never fails to jazz me up. I love how the English lyrics tie back around into a loop with the answer to the question coming first. I just like it. It flows really nicely, and I think people give this song a bit of a hard time, so I wanted to give my two cents on why it's great, actually. <laughs> but because it's rather straightforward, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it. What we're really here for today is Don't Think Twice and or Chikai, which is a whole other matter entirely, and this song only plays at the end of the game. So, if you don't know, the lyrics of Don't Think Twice and Chikai are actually quite different, despite them being the same song. Each version gives the perspective of someone talking to or about 
another person and trying to make their impossible love a reality. And if you ask me, don't think twice and Chikai make the most sense when viewed as two separate but linked love songs on opposite perspectives of the same relationship. So for this analysis, I will be treating Don't Think Twice and Chikai as different songs that complement each other. Now, of course, it's only natural that there are differences between the English and Japanese versions of the songs, because to translate the song and still have it make sense lyrically requires changing some of the wording and phrasing. Simple and Clean and Sanctuary do have many differences, and you could make the argument that they are completely different songs from their original Japanese counterparts, but overall, the language difference doesn't mean that the songs aren't expressing at least very similar ideas. What makes the differences between Don't Think Twice and Chikai notable is that, in many cases, the lyrics aren't expressing the same ideas at all, only to come together at the end and tie the two versions of the same song back together. Another thing that's interesting is that the lyrics don't seem to really match up with the plot of Kingdom Hearts 3 in the way that Simple and Clean or Sanctuary did, but, like I said, seem to be granting us some foresight into the characters' feelings. Which makes sense if this is a song written when looking at a plot synopsis of the series so far. Now, I realize that that take might turn some heads, because on a first listen to Don't Think Twice, I think a lot of people assume that the song is the storyline happening between Sora and Kairi in Kingdom Hearts 3. And I don't blame them, because that was the first assumption I made as well. And of course, we all know that this song plays over Sora and Kairi's final moments together. But it should be noted that historically for this series, these songs don't tend to match up with what is exactly happening in that moment of the game. They more so serve as cool emotional track to end things off with a bang, and also express maybe some cool character insights if you give the lyrics a deep dive and remove them from the visuals. Which is why I'm not taking when this song is played in-game into account, because I don't think that it matters. Regardless, Don't Think Twice and Chikai's lyrics do seem to really match the attitudes and perspectives of two specific characters. And since we know that these are based on a plot synopsis of the series, it's hard to believe that this could just be a coincidence or an accident. <laughs> okay, I'll get to Chikai in a minute, but first let's cover them one at a time and start with the track that you're probably all more familiar with, Don't Think Twice. We don't have confirmation on how this song relates exactly to Kingdom Hearts, specifically from Nomura, Utada, or any of the other staff but it's pretty commonly agreed upon that Don't Think Twice is from Sora's perspective. Even just one listen to the song can give you that impression, even if you don't think twice about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and one way that it manages to do that is by capturing some of Sora's upbeat, naive personality, and even allude to his ongoing biggest character struggle in the lyrics. Now, you know I would love to just play you bits of the song for this discussion, but I don't want copyright breathing down my neck, so please indulge my slam poetry readings of specific lyrics instead. I do have the song linked in the cards as well, so please go give the song a listen and come back if you feel so inclined. How did I live in a kingdom of thieves? And people who say things they don't really mean. This is a pretty straightforward start and can easily be tied to Sora's journey over the course of the series. He's constantly dealing with bad guys and people who lie to him or lie about their feelings, and Sora has definitely been affected by that in ways that he sometimes doesn't fully understand. You're only everything I ever dreamed of. You must be kidding me. Did you really think I could say no? Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Now, this is a lyric that really stands out for its Sora-isms, the first of many. The kind of gung-ho attitude and willingness to hop aboard with even a little you must be kidding me really sells the idea of this coming from Sora's point of view. I want you for a lifetime, so if you're gonna think twice, I don't wanna know. Everything's just right, but if you're gonna think twice, I don't wanna know. Here we hit some of Sora's central character conflict, only wanting to focus on the positive and not dwell on the negatives. 
but he's also reassuring the other person that everything's fine and please don't think too hard about this. I really don't get what everyone else believes. So why do I say things I don't really mean? I'm only crying because I never dreamed it'd take this long. Don't think twice. These lines highlight some of Sora's naivete and some of his own self-doubts. He's gone from thinking about the people around him who say things that they don't really mean to wondering why he sometimes says things that he doesn't really mean. And I think that this ties in perfectly with Sora's failing self-confidence in Kingdom Hearts 3. I really don't get what everyone else believes. Also reminds me of the character file story we get from Sora's point of view where he confesses that he really doesn't get what love is supposed to be. If you want to take it to an even higher level, all you gotta do is say the word, you know I'll follow. If you want to take it to an even higher level, I don't, I don't bite. If you want to make it happen, nothing's impossible. All you gotta do is say the word, your walls will crumble. If you want to make it happen, nothing's impossible. Here, we have Sora again, affirming to the character that he is just waiting for their signal to make something happen, to elevate their relationship. You know I'll follow your lead, you just gotta take the first step kind of thing. What's interesting though, is that there's this kind of assumption that their relationship is in some way impossible, or at least difficult, partly because the other person has walls up that need to be broken down, words that need to be said before it can happen. Hmm. You don't say. <laughs> and then, of course, we get to the iconic Kiss me once, kiss me twice, kiss me three times, cross the line. Don't think twice. And then repeat that and don't think twice over and over again. There's a lot of questioning and a lot of naive optimism and a sense of being unsure of your own feelings on this side of the song, but still an urge to push forward and just go for it. The main sticking point of Don't Think Twice is its namesake. The song repeats over and over again. Everything's just right, but if you're gonna think twice, I don't wanna know. Don't think twice about it. And I think this kind of simple, straightforward thinking suits Sora perfectly. It's a kind of reckless, throw caution to the wind kind of attitude that Sora is known for, but it's also very earnest and sincere, something I think we can all agree feels very Sora. Like I mentioned before, it also just has that hint of Sora's think happy thoughts mindset. If you're gonna think twice, I don't wanna know, everything's fine. It just kind of perfectly captures Sora's attitude on life. It has that impatience of, come on, let's stop worrying about it and just be together already. So if we are to believe that this is Sora's side to a love song, it's also a lot more forward and kind of aggressive in pursuing a relationship than Sora's ever been in regards to being with Kairi. Remember, this is the same Sora who's seen Kairi's cave drawing at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2 and then proceeded to do an absolute amount of zero things to progress that relationship. And it sticks out to me how there's a lyric specifically calling attention to you must be kidding me. Did you really think I could say no? When Sora's gut reaction to Kairi giving him a Pau Pau fruit is to literally shake his head no. And please try to understand, I'm not trying to diss on that relationship. It's just me pointing out that Sora does not really actively pursue in making a romance with Kairi happen. And therefore, it doesn't really match the tone of the song or what it's saying lyrically. Now, I would argue, though, that it does match up with how Sora treats Riku. Now, I don't think that Sora is pursuing Riku romantically by this point in the story, but this kind of chase, confusion, and determination to be together fits with Sora and Riku's dynamic throughout the series much stronger. In fact, you could even say that it fits shockingly well. After all, who else would Sora have to tell Stop thinking too hard about this, man. <laughs> Riku, come on, man. Why did you try to do so much on your own? Sora, I can't. Don't say another word. It's not over. It's just not. How can you say that? Even if we could go on. Look where we are. Aw, oh, come on, Riku. You've been hanging out in darkness too long. 
You gotta try and think positive. I wished I could live life the way you do. Just following my heart. The person Sora is talking to has their guard up. Walls that need to be brought down. Things that need to be said before their relationship can progress and be taken to an even higher level. Which is also a lyric that kind of implies a more competitive nature between the two people. And we can't ignore lines like, if you want to make it happen, nothing's impossible, and kiss me once, kiss me twice, kiss me three times, cross the line. Which imply that there is something difficult, something seemingly impossible about this relationship. I'm only crying because I never dreamed it'd take this long. That also's got my attention. Many Kingdom Hearts fans have talked about how this line in particular almost feels like a meta-commentary on Kingdom Hearts 3 itself. How it took so long for it to come out, and how finally getting the game felt like a dream come true. But looking at this with Kingdom Hearts 3's story and this song's implication in mind, I almost see it as a meta-commentary on why Kingdom Hearts 3 took so long. If Kingdom Hearts 3 puts such an emphasis on continuing to imply Riku's feelings for Sora and truly is setting up a queer romance like I think it is, then this lyrics touches on that feeling. That feeling of, oh my god, they finally get to move the story forward because they finally got the okay to do this. That is going to be the topic of a whole other video though, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> Now, like I mentioned earlier, Don't Think Twice and Chikai have pretty different lyrics, expressing different ideas. So if Don't Think Twice is from Sora's point of view, whose point of view is Chikai from? <laughs> I mean, okay, <laughs> you already know I'm going to say Riku, so I, I won't play dumb with you. But really, uh, I need you to just take these lyrics in. Hold on to something, because if you've never heard them translated before, this is going to be a lot. I just want to preface this by reminding you of the backwards lyrics in Sanctuary being Riku's hidden cry for true emotions and affection. And what I said in the last video about Riku feeling like he doesn't deserve the happy ending that he hopes for. I don't care much about Destiny. But at this point, I cannot but acknowledge its existence. Are you really sure you're happy with me? Really? I wish you wouldn't raise my hopes up too much. I... <laughs> I mean... Oh, holy shit, you guys. We're three lines into the song. Are you even kidding me? <laughs> you're seeing what I'm seeing, right? The tone for this is already so different from Don't Think Twice, and we already see why Sora has to reassure the person in this song. Are you sure you're really happy with me? Really? I wish you wouldn't raise my hopes up too much. I'm... Oh... <sighs> okay, <laughs> I, I need a minute. Hmm... Are you really happy with me? Really? This kind of self-doubt could in practice, apply to a lot of characters. But considering how Riku thinks he's unwanted or in the way, and a lot of his character arc has been about his self-redemption, it really only seems fitting to attribute this to Riku. I mean, this all just really screams Riku right from the get-go. This is what I mean when I say the song just kind of slaps you across the face. But wait, if that's not enough, there's more! Today is the perfect day for a truthful, eternal vow. We don't need beautiful flowers or witnesses. Let's wear rings of the same color. Hmm, very poetic. A vow, you say? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. That's cool, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> it's so damn annoying that I want to fall asleep clinging to you every day. I will not make promises anymore. Those things are for pleasing somebody. What I am about to say is not a secondhand line, nor a promise, it's a vow. <sighs> okay, okay, all right. First off, the phrasing here reads very much as stuff Riku would say. Things like, 
It's so damn annoying that I want to fall asleep clinging to you every day. Now, these lyrics are translated by Utada themselves, but I've definitely seen this line get translated multiple ways. It basically expresses the idea of being so annoyed or embarrassed because this makes me look uncool. <laughs> and there's really only one character I can think about who would feel that kind of way towards Sora. Riku is the cool guy after all, so this line of thought only seems natural to be something that Riku would worry about. If you were turning your head and squinting to make the lyrics fit Kairi up to this point, this is the line that I really feel just puts a nail in that coffin. This is Riku's side of the song. And already we're getting a lot of feelings. Fall asleep clinging to you? Let's wear rings of the same color? I wish you wouldn't get my hopes up. Are you really sure you're happy with me? Oh, <laughs> oh, Riku. We also need to talk about the differences between Riku's vow to protect his most precious person and Sora and Kairi sharing the Paupu fruit. These lyrics say, I will not make promises anymore. Those things are for pleasing somebody. What I'm about to say is not a secondhand line nor a promise, it's a vow. We discussed how the Paupu shared between Sora and Kairi was a bit muddled in its English translation. Kairi was supposed to be reassuring Sora that the fruit is just a good luck charm, and that's why Sora agrees to do it. So, I will not make promises anymore, those things are for pleasing somebody, almost feels like a direct rebuke to that scene. And with the earlier line of the singer not putting a whole lot of faith in Destiny, it's pretty obvious that this song just can't be from Kyrie's perspective. We know so little about Kyrie, but I think it's safe to say that she does place a lot of faith in things like Lucky Charms and Destiny. Her keyblade is even named Destiny's Embrace. Kyrie embraces Destiny. Praise for sorrows to end and all that jazz. Oathkeeper's Japanese name is Promise Charm. Promises, charms, and destiny is kind of Kairi's thing. So if this song is supposed to be from her perspective, or about her in any way, this feels like it's really ill-fitting. But it would make sense for Riku to feel bitter about destiny, given everything that's happened to him, and how he's had to struggle to even get where he is now. Riku doesn't want to make what he feels are flimsy promises. He wants to make a vow. Intense. All right, more song. I can't go back to being the liar I used to be. Our rings shall be the color of the sunrise. Let your heart beat on top of mine and let's dance. Let's celebrate the fact that we live in this moment. I swear, each new part of this song makes me go a little crazy. Can't go back to the liar you used to be, huh? Yeah? <laughs> okay. And you know, I am thinking about the fact that Dream Drop Distance's Dearly Beloved was a waltz when I am looking at that line about dancing. Oh, and look at that. We also get to find out Riku's preferred colors for their wedding rings. Wow, Riku, the sunrise, huh? <sighs> now, some of you might be wondering why that's so significant, and I'll be delighted to answer. You see, Namora, he loves sky symbolism. Obviously, Sora means sky, and there's been a slew of symbolism to go along with that over the years. Nomura even loves hiding sky symbolism into different illustrations for the games. Since the composition of the first picture I drew, Distance, was too bold to use easily, I quickly drew this new piece. With the ease of use in mind, I drew each of the three on separate layers and organized it so the positions could be adjusted. Even though I drew it in a rush, I like it. I think it managed to convey the tagline in a simple way. Darkness becomes light, light falls into darkness. While drawing Sea of Clouds, I thought it was meaningful that it could be looked at upside down, so I made another version just in case. The Japanese word hakume can refer to light of both sunrise and sunset, and since this is a picture where it could be either, I made that the title. It's not a simple reversal of Sea of Clouds. Is Riku falling to save Sora, or is Sora rising out of reach? It can be seen both ways. 
Sea of Clouds actually has the same meaning. So here's a clear example of using different times of the sky to symbolize something about the illustration and the games themselves. But even within the games themselves, Sora is often linked to a bright blue sky, and Kairi is linked to sunsets. I didn't actually originally draw this as box art. I planned to do something with Kairi in her usual clothes, but it was well received and was close to the idea I had for the box art anyway, so we just went with this. I went back and forth whether to set it at sunset, but since this picture was presented around the time of the relaunch, I gave it a bright blue sky. So while Kairi is linked to sunsets, Riku is associated with the sunrise or the dawn. I'm taking the middle road. Do you mean the twilight road to nightfall? No. It's the road to dawn. Riku's weapon is even named Way to Dawn, and his art for Chain of Memories, a companion piece to Sora's side, is titled Crossroads Dawn. So Riku is pretty specifically and consistently associated with the dawn and sunrise. So, uh, the lyrics calling out the color of sunrise definitely feels pretty specific to me. The tears I can't hold back sometimes, there's no deep meaning to them. It's just I recall the past unexpectedly. Uh, I want to cry. A light streams in from the open door. Again, which other character with feelings for Sora would want to cry about the past? The connotation here is definitely something regretful and full of remorse for something that happened in the past that the singer of the song just can't help but dwell on. A light streams in from the open door. Now this line, this line right here, is seemingly completely random and out of context with everything else going on, but wait, oh... Who has gone through the door of light? Oh yeah. The door to light. We'll go together. Yeah. Sora and Riku. I mean, come on. Showing Sora and Riku walking through the Door of Light together is not just calling back to Kingdom Hearts 2. In Kingdom Hearts 1, Sora and Riku were on opposite sides of the Door of Light. In 2, they get to walk through it together. And Dream Drop Distance called back to this moment again in the credits as a hint that Kingdom Hearts 3 was coming. And of course, then, Kingdom Hearts 3's opening alludes to the Door of Light as well, with the door opening and several of the Guardians of Light seeing it open the only one out of them walking confidently towards the door as though they were ready and expecting it is Riku. Again and again, there's just too many specific things for this just to be a coincidence, even only knowing that Utada was given a plot synopsis and she herself felt compelled and even asked to do two songs for Kingdom Hearts 3 says a lot about this kind of care that was put into the songs. I want to be with you for a very long time. Other options have long been gone. Today is the perfect day for an unprecedented vow. Our vow. Yeah, so overall, <laughs> these lyrics just make me want to scream, vomit, cry, the whole nine yards. It's, it's just a lot. Uh, and then when I look at all of this, I'm just immediately thinking of Riku. There's no way in my mind that these lyrics are about anyone else. There are so many Riku-specific things that it's hard to ignore. I want to expand on a point I made in the last video, where I said that Riku doesn't believe that a fairy tale ending with Sora is even on the table. There's actually a lot to back up this idea that Riku has something that he can't tell Sora. 
and it's causing him a lot of internal misery and grief. And this has been another extremely consistent character trait of his for a long time. Right, because Kyrie would only think of Sora. But I was the same way. When Sora and I were together, we could go anywhere. I really believed that. He really did want to see Sora and talk, but that was impossible with this appearance. The things that mattered the most were what he couldn't tell Sora. It had always been that way. Riku shook his head quietly. I was speaking from personal experience. It's like Quasimodo said, I'm the one building these walls around myself. Whether I stay in this prison of darkness or move into the light is up to me. Riku lowered his gaze. He knew by now that keeping his heart under lock and key was the same as letting the darkness control it. Where is my heart destined for? Will I find the answer by opening the doors of sleep and stepping through? When my mark of mastery exam is over, will I have my answer? I want to hurry ahead, but there's some small part of me that's still hesitating. Am I afraid? Or is it something else? Jiminy hopped onto Pinocchio's shoulder as he looked into Riku's face. Sure, you can't shoulder all your problems alone, you know. You must have somebody, a friend you can talk to. The cricket's question made Riku think of Sora. Of course, Riku couldn't tell him everything. But Sora was still a friend with a special place in his heart. Yeah, actually, I do. Riku closed his eyes and imagined Sora's face for a moment. Then he looked at Pinocchio and Jiminy. That stupid grin he's always wearing. He's the best teacher I could ever have. Do you have any idea how lonely it is here? How frightening it is to have no one? All that's left in my heart is misery and despair. And now, you can share it. There's no need. Got my own. So the games and the novels have established that there's just some kind of misery that Riku is holding on to, even after he has supposedly redeemed himself and many in the fandom thinking that his character arc is complete. And also, there is just something he can't tell Sora. What could it be? <laughs> And then here comes Chikai with all of its very specific Rikuisms and so much pining and longing, it's quite frankly jaw-dropping at just how blatant it is. I want to be with you for a very long time. Other options have long been gone. Today is the perfect day for an unprecedented vow. Our vow. So we see this idea again of this vow of love being unprecedented. Don't Think Twice talked about it as something impossible that they are able to make real. And here it's talking about their love vow as something so strong that it's never been seen before. And I am truly sorry to have to keep bringing up Kyrie in this, but this kind of statement just doesn't mesh well with a so Kai romance. There's nothing impossible or unprecedented about Sora and Kyrie getting together. If Utada was writing this song based off of a plot synopsis of Sora and Kairi's relationship up to this point, these are not the beats or the kind of tone I would have gone with. But wouldn't you know, it just so happens to line up stunningly well with Sora and Riku's relationship and expresses a lot of the pining and longing that I've seen from Riku in the games up to this point. You really don't have to look terribly hard to fit this to Sora and Riku, but you would have to make several leaps to make this work for Sora and Kairi. So now it's Chikai's turn to get to the chorus, but Riku's side is a bit different. Kiss me once, kiss me twice, once isn't enough. Kiss me once, kiss me twice, please give me you. Kiss me once, kiss me twice, kiss me three times. Please. <laughs> kiss me once, kiss me twice, give me you. <sighs> Let's listen to the sound of the sunrise, side by side. Let's vow to live our lives together. 
More deep pining and longing coming from the world's most embarrassing boy, Riku. <laughs> and, of course, one last mention of the sunrise and the vow to tie it up into a nice little bow. And you can see how both songs are complementary to each other. Chikai has all these moments of remorse, longing, and dedication, but still being unsure of their own worthiness. While Don't Think Twice is trying to encourage the other one to put their doubts aside, and they might not understand everything right now, but if we're together, we'll make this work. When these songs were first revealed to us is also something worth taking note of. Chikai had its very own trailer to reveal the song. But you know what else was a big reveal for that trailer? It was our first look at Riku, and it was actually his reveal trailer as well. And then, in the final battle trailer, we hear Don't Think Twice, and it starts playing at the end of the song, where Kiss Me Once, Kiss Me Twice comes in right when Riku's sacrifice is being shown, and it's the climax of the trailer. And it should be noted that these trailers were all made in-house, too, which means that the Kingdom Hearts team and Nomura specifically were in charge of the whole presentation of them, to believe that both of these trailers being this way is just somehow a coincidence is a bit absurd. Both songs climax with the final verses, and I just want to put the lyrics side by side for you to see. Kiss me once, kiss me twice, and then the two split off again with don't think twice, saying kiss me three times, cross the line, asking the other person to cross the line and take the first step. While Chikai says once is not enough, give yourself to me, please. Which in a lot of ways, also feels like a direct follow-up to I need more affection than you know from Sanctuary. The longing is palpable. <laughs> I'm just reeling, okay? It is so full of raw emotions. And if you only ever listen to the English version of the song, you're really only getting half of the message here. So it really is worth the effort to listen to both of these tracks back to back. And if it is the case that this is supposed to be two different sides of a love song, I think that's brilliant. And I have no doubts that an amazing songwriter like Utada could pull this kind of deeply layered double meaning off. It's extremely pointed, very romantic, and it drives me nuts. <laughs> and the fact that both versions of the song allude to waiting a long time for this to happen. This is our unprecedented vow. I never dreamed it would take this long. If you want to make it happen, nothing's impossible. It definitely gives me the vibe that this love story was faced with opposition, or maybe seemed impossible. And while I think a lot of stories follow that idea, it speaks very clearly to a queer story, where we constantly feel like we have to wait for the rest of the world to catch up, just so that we can have our own happiness. And that seems like a very pointed theme of the song. And sure, you could argue against me and throw everything that I've said out the window and just say that this is all somehow a shocking coincidence. Like I said, we do not have anyone on the staff saying anything about this song or how it ties into the story. If anything, I find their silence on its meaning kind of telling. It'd be so easy to casually mention that this is a song about Sora and Kairi's relationship and shut down the idea of it being anything else. I could be wrong. But I would rather approach this in good faith and assume that people know how to do their jobs rather than just dismiss it as nothing. We do know that Nomura gave Utada a plot synopsis of the series. The series is about Sora and Riku. Kingdom Hearts 3 shows Riku doing a true love sacrifice for Sora. The promotional material centers this song around Riku in some telling ways. The lyrics line up shockingly well and would, in fact, contradict a romance between Sora and Kairi. It's just too much for me to really humor the idea of it being an accident or unintended, especially when the song seems so blatant on closer inspection. It's also why it doesn't surprise me that from what I've seen, 
The JP fandom seems to understand the queer narrative going on in Kingdom Hearts better overall than most English-speaking audiences. I mean, I can't imagine listening to and understanding the lyrics of Chikai and thinking, ah, yes, this definitely describes Sora and Kairi's relationship. While on the other hand, most English-speaking players are either of the mindset that the Utada songs are just random and don't mean anything for the series, or that Don't Think Twice is about Sora and Kairi because it plays at the end of the game. Even though they would be wrong about both of those assumptions, I think it's an understandable misconception unless you did a bit more digging. Anyway, you should totally go give both of these versions of the song a listen and come back to me and tell me how you handled it, because when I listen to them back to back, I want to lay on the floor and cry. Wow, they're so in love. Good for them. <laughs> anyway, next time I'll cover something that's not Kingdom Hearts 3 related, because I've got topics spanning the whole series still. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support the things I do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe for the next video, and check out my Patreon if that is something that you can do. It really helps me out when I am dealing with medical stuff like this. Anyway, have a fantastic week, and stay inspired.